Women's Day, and the defending champion was holding court. The first big upset of the Open sends one of the men's favorites to the sidelines. And speaking of untimely departures, is it time to say goodbye to the wooden racket? We'll find out at the U.S. Open. The first round of the U.S. Open is now winding down, and today and tonight, under these beautiful weather conditions, the 256-player field is being cut in half. Today, as I said, was Women's Day here at the Open, and our two top seeds were basking in the limelight. Good evening, everybody. I'm Brent Musburger. Joining me tonight, the 1968 U.S. Open champion, Virginia Wade. Virginia, I can't believe you're not playing singles. You would advance to the semifinals this year. <laughs> no, but I miss it, but uh, at least I'm really enjoying watching everybody at leisure. Let's take a look at those two top seeds, Chris Everett Lloyd and Martina Navratilova. I think one of them out there for about an hour. Chris took on Janine Thompson, the left-hander from Australia. Yes, and Janine played a pretty good match, but playing a pretty good match against Chris doesn't mean you get too much mileage out of it. She's a very promising young player from Australia. People have been looking at her for a while, and you can see here that she is hitting good shots, but nothing is going to beat Chris. Chris is solid. She's always going to play about as well at the beginning of the tournament as she does at the end. She's not a slow starter. And she played a, what for her is a routine match today. John Lloyd is watching her playing today. She watched him yesterday. She said how nervous she got when he played, but he won his match and he'll be out there tomorrow. So I think that Chris will be happy today to have won comfortably. That was in the grandstand, and over in the stadium, it was Martina Navratilova against Pascal Paradis of France. Well, in fact, I've been working with Pascal, and she's been playing awfully well, but it's a bit of a tall order to come out and uh, play Martina on the sa uh, stadium court on the first day. Martina got better and better as the match went on. And you see Mike Estep, who works Martina out extremely hard, and however well Pascal played, Martina was better. And you asked Martina afterwards about not being seated number one. Being seated number two, does that give you added incentive? Not really. It's, uh, the computer works in uh, strange ways, uh, but uh, I think this will decide the number one ranking pretty much. I think if Chris wins this one, and then maybe I win the Australian, it'll be up in the air. If I win this one, then, uh, then I think it pretty much will sew it up. So. Uh, this might decide the number one ranking, regardless of who's number one right now. And next for Martina is Lisa Bonder, and Chris will take on Raffaella Reggi of Italy. Uh, is there anyone who can break through and upset either of them in this march to the final? There are a lot of good players who could, on a given day, beat either of them, but if you put them out in the stadium, I don't think that you're going to get any upsets. Different pressures out there, indeed. I've got a bit of news today about women's tennis now. The Women's Tennis Association has announced a new series of proposed rules for players under the age of 18. And among the new rules would limit the number of tournaments per year and require all players under 16 to abstain from tournament play for a minimum of two 30-day periods within a calendar year. Now, one of the players these new rules could affect is 15-year-old Gabriela Sabatini of Argentina, who has been doing for women's tennis what Boris Becker has done for the men. But then tonight, she ran into a buzzsaw, hard-serving Barbara Potter, the left-hander from Connecticut. Well, Barbara won the tournament last week in Monticello, New York, and so obviously she's confident in playing uh, at top form. Now, tonight, she just was revved up. She served superbly well, especially with that left-handed serve of hers into the left court. And Gabriella really wasn't out there challenging. And you know, uh, Brent, to me, she did look a little bit tired. She looked as if maybe this was an ordeal rather than just pleasure and excitement and, and uh, a pleasure to be new on the circuit. They are in the second set now. Sabatini lost the first one 6-4, and Potter just would not let her get back into the match. And you can see that strong left-handed service just wore down Gabriel, who does possess some magnificent shots like that one right there. Well, that backhand the first down the line, that extremely topspun shot, is her great weapon. But, you know, if somebody is charging the net as effectively as Barbara was today, 
you're not going to be able to get through them. Virginia, I think this was what you were referring to. During a court change, our cameras picked up a very weary-looking Gabriella Sabatini. Well, you know, this for the first time, she's actually seeded in this tournament, so now she's supposed to have the pressures of a really experienced player. Good to be back in New York. It really is. It's a turn on, and uh, as I said earlier, I feel a uh, real live tension when I'm in the center court. Barbara telling us she likes that atmosphere of that stadium. Tell me about the new rules. Could that, in effect, help someone like Gabriella, give her more time off to mature? I'm sure we're at the point where they have to do something about it because it just seems so sad that we might lose somebody like Gabriella because they overplay when they're too young. Great scene. You, can, you are going to play doubles this year, though. I right? certainly am. Okay, we'll be hearing from Virginia throughout this U.S. Open. And, of course, still ahead of us tonight, the first major upset of the tournament and the debut of Jimmy Connors. All that and more when we continue for the National Tennis Center here on CBS after this. The 1985 U.S. Open Highlight Show is sponsored by Shearson Lehman Brothers and the Serious Investor mind over money and by the Mycotin cure for athlete's foot listening learning informing educating planning advising relating this is the process of investing with a financial consultant if this is the way you like to do business, then you should talk with a financial consultant. They're available at Shearson Lehman Brothers. The Serious Investor and Shearson Lehman Brothers. Minds over money. In the beginning, man's feet walked free. But the road to civilization was paved, so man developed shoes. Soon after that, man developed athlete's foot. He died. Today, there's Mycotin. Mycotin cures athlete's foot. It's the only athlete's foot medicine you can buy with Myconazole, a patented ingredient recommended by specialists to cure athlete's foot. Mycotin in spray powder or cream. Mycotin, the end of the road for athlete's foot. The men's story featured the biggest upset of the tournament so far. Packing his bags much earlier than expected, our fifth seed, Kevin Curran, this year's Wimbledon finalist, beaten by Guy Forget of France. Forget only 20 years old, and his best tennis still ahead of him. Today, he dominated Curran, but this was the critical point in the match. Tiebreaker first set, both of them on service, but Forget breaks through. Curran was never able to regain his tempo. Forget serving in the tiebreaker at 6 4. Game for set, Forget. Set game for six. And in the second set, and Curran quickly fell behind 1 2. And again, Forget caught him leaning the wrong way and came down the line with the winner. Nothing is going right for Curran. This point, typical of his afternoon at the grandstand. For Forget, 18 aces. Double what Curran served. And Curran's coach knows that his pupil is in serious trouble. Here comes another ace, and it was 30 love. And he'll hit him with his third straight to go up 40 love. And Curran can only look on in disgust. It is triple match point. And when it was over, I asked Forget to describe his upset. Uh, I think today I didn't put as many first serves as he wanted to, and uh, my returns were pretty pretty good, and I served very, very well. So I, I think I played a very good match today. Will you ever feel real comfortable here on this surface? You do so well on grass. Will you someday be able to come in here and do the same thing? I think if they move the US Open in Los Angeles or uh, some uh, reasonable city, I may feel comfortable, but as long as it's here, I'll continue to struggle. And then in the news conference, Curran very critical of New York and the whole setting. He said that they should, quote, drop an A-bomb on this place. Now, at the other end of the emotional spectrum is a man who loves New York almost as much as the mayor, Ed Koch. One James Scott Connors, who credits the New York crowd for...